everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here. Uh, bouncing out of the office, headed to the gym. Uh, getting right, like I said, not waiting until 2022 uh, to try to get things going and the momentum built to do the things that I need to do. Do they have this blocked up? Oh. Uh, as I say often, it's about getting things done. Uh, and it's immediate, it's immensely important to get started and momentum built, moving into a transition phase. And transitioning out of one year into the next uh, is a major mental, psychological, and emotional phase. Uh, it has nothing to do with the calendar, but the mental acknowledgement of a transition period and it's immensely important that you move and get yourself already going, already established, already focused, not waiting till you get there and trying to set up some type of New Year's resolution that you start flat-footed and burn out on in the first 90 days or less, most of the times less. And being a person that goes to the gym, I see this every year. You can't get a machine anywhere in the gym starting January through about February, March starts to go down. By April, I mean, almost all of them are gone. Um, happens every year. Uh, the thing to do is, the things that cause you to win, and this ain't even why I'm here, but the things that cause you to win in life are from habits. You have to develop habits that produce results you want. Right now, you're actually uh, executing habits that produce results you don't want if you're not where you want to be. And so the way that you do that is you got to develop the habits. Don't wait till you get to a to the next step after a transition phase. Move into that transition phase. It's a lot of power exchange that takes place in that transition phase that you don't get to benefit from if you wait. With that being said, look, I'm here to talk to you about primetime Dion Sanders. Prime time. Uh, definitely my uh, uh, favorite cornerback of all time. And I actually am a big fan of, and I personally know uh, Charles Woodson. But Dion, man, Wood, don't get me wrong, Wood probably the most athletic, not the fastest, that would be Dion, but the most athletic, all around athlete. I know the dude was a beast. Um, the fact that he was a defensive player that won the Heisman in uh, college at Michigan speaks volumes. I don't take any way, anything away from that dude. Exceptional, extraordinary, Hall of Famer. But Dion changed the way games were played. Quarterbacks lost half of a field because of this dude. Um, and there have been a couple that have come along that have been pretty good and tight. Uh, Revis was close, but not not Dion. Dion literally changed the game. Exceptional, extraordinary, extremely fast, but technically, I mean, technically sound, uh, very astute. Uh, and he's proven to be more than just an athlete, more than just someone who had prowess on the field. Uh, when I first heard that he had accepted the job at Jackson State, I said, man, that's huge. Uh, and a lot of people let me, why would he do that? Why would he go to Jackson State? Why was, but the very reason he went to Jackson State is, the, is, 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 is represented in how many people thought it was stupid that he went. You know, you have all these historically black universities that are struggling in so many ways. We just saw um, what, what o over the last semester, what was going on at Howard uh, University and students, horrible conditions and, and so many levels of ineptitude from uh, upper administration on down. And a lot of that has to do with lack of funds uh, poor operation and a bunch of things that can be rectified and everybody's talking about you know this boost of money that the HBCUs were supposed to get from the government 
and uh, it's a fraction of what was initially promised. I'm not gonna get into that because uh, that's not why I'm on here, but I'm not gonna get into that. What I am going to do is I'm gonna talk about a scaling out of an idea or concept. And what I mean by that, Dion opened the door. And if you don't notice, there's a couple of other uh, ex-football players that took HBCU jobs. Uh, Eddie George was one. And Eddie George had a good NFL career, was a, a Heisman Trophy winner, uh, doesn't have the recognizable brand of primetime, uh, but who does? That's why Dion was the perfect example of... Uh, I mean, not the perfect, but the perfect person to actually initiate this and make this thing happen. What we see after that is a uh, former uh, coach, uh, NFL coach Hugh Jackson takes the Grambling State job. So now you're taking high quality, recognizable names and you're putting them in positions that kids will recognize. This guy, why is Hugh important? because Hugh coached at the highest level. He coached uh, in the NFL as a head coach. What does he know? How players need to play at the next level. Uh, he can prepare you, not just physically, but mentally. Um, and this is so much bigger than the sport itself. This is what I've seen Dion do that I'm most proud of. He's preparing them to be men because only a couple of them every year are actually going pro. But all can leave as men. All can come there and learn principles that will travel with them throughout their lifetime, that will allow them to do some things. Now, there's some things he did that I don't necessarily roll with, but Dion is Dion and you know, that things he did as a player uh, off the field that, you know, I thought was like a little over the top, but that was prime time. That's his persona. Uh, when he brought Brittany Renner in, I was like, what are you doing, dude? Uh, and everybody's got their, you know, in input and speculation to what was really going on with that. Um, I think that if you want to show these young cats what it's like to be out there in that spotlight and how women really literally hawk and plot and plan, you bring in the best. She's been doing it for a minute. You know, this young cat that she got the baby by, got married to and got the baby by, then immediately divorced out of Charlotte that plays for the Bobcats. He's not the first, man. This, this, this woman... You know, they've been through Colin Kaepernick and a few others trying to get the bag and has been very open that that was going to be her method of getting the bag. When she couldn't get a more older, mature cat like Colin to slip up, she went for something a little more easy. Somebody six, seven years younger than her. So what? who better to get there? Not, wouldn't, wouldn't have been my play, but... Dion, this is what Dion says he was thinking. I'm going to show you what they're like. Now, as a former athlete and a person who lives in Houston, if you are not familiar with Houston and you are a person familiar with people who have money or people considered ballers, whether they're athletes, entertainers, uh, anybody, actors, anybody that if you see them and recognize them, you know they got a bag, ask them about Houston. Houston is the mecca of, of, of females who are solely looking for that, that dude. And I'm not talking about the, 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 the low level type of female that's coming out and, you know, and all that nothing. These, these are women who of themselves have something going. But their, mode, their motive for going after dudes 
are it's the motives that aren't pure these women are attorneys these women are nurses these women are professionals making six figures in, in many instances but six figures doesn't compare to somebody with a fixed 56 million dollar contract and this is put it like this back in the day you could talk to uh, NBA players or NFL players' wives. And most of the time, those cats travel with the team because they have to travel with the team. And their wives stay at home. When they would come play a game in Houston, wife coming. After you lead a game, if you're going to be there overnight, I'm going to be where you at. That's how bad Houston is. So what I'm telling you is I know from living in an environment and then being out there, you know, years ago, being out there amongst that, how that works. And it's a game that, that, that the average person ain't ready for. You're not ready for this. I don't care how much you got jocked in high school. I don't care how much you got jocked in college. You're not ready for the game because it's not just about jocking you. It's not just about wanting to sleep with you. They looking to get you. And some of the stuff that I done heard these girls do to get these dudes is crazy. You would be like, no, nah, dude, you stop, stop lying. No, I am immensely real about that. And I didn't want the whole thing to be about this, but I just, it just kind of got on me that he did that. But that's a part of the process they need to understand that with their success comes challenges. And while obviously becoming a professional athlete is gonna expose you to people who want to take advantage of you and not just females it's going to be cats out there that are going to be want to be a part of your entourage it's going to be cats out there that's going to have all types of business opportunities they're going to want to run by you because they want you to fund it and finance it. it's going to be all types of schemes you're going to have to navigate through your entire career and beyond it's just simply how it is you need to be aware of what's going on and you need to be able to think for yourself and, and you can't go into this world naive you also have to go into this world understanding that your career is probably not going to be that long. The average NFL career, depending on position, is somewhere around four or five years. For running backs, it's a lot less, two and a half. They don't last long. So, you know, for every person you see out there and they've had this uh, uh, lustru illustrious 15-year uh, career, that was somebody that got, got blew out, injury or whatever else, their first season, their second season. And so all of this means that what you're having, you know, for instance, if you got a major, major deal and you're making 15 million a year, I'm just throwing a number out there. What you got to understand in that is that 15 mil is sweet, especially in football, because it's not all of it's going to be guaranteed money. So that is sweet, but it's not guaranteed. You can't look at it like I'm going to get 15 million the rest of my life. You got to look at it like this might be the only 15 mil I get. And so I got to be smart with it. And Dion can teach him that. Dion can teach him that until you get to a point where your outside money is bigger than your football money, you ain't made it yet. That's another part of the game. But more importantly, I think that it starts to build a pride in something that is associated with us. The idea that because you are a top athlete in the country, you need to go to a top five, uh, you know, D1 school, you know, the Alabamas, the, the Clemsons, the Georgias, and, and all of that, and, you know, is in one way saying that you know, you can't represent, but see the whole idea again is I'm trying to go pro. What's my best chance of going pro? Well, Dion, if he stays four years and he starts taking kids who are freshmen and he starts putting them into the league, he's going to change the trajectory of how kids think. He's also going to change the minds of a lot of black coaches who can't get opportunities in the league are at uh, D1 schools. He's gonna change their minds in the sense of being willing to go and teach, I mean, excuse me, and coach at uh, HBCUs because there's gonna be talent there. There's gonna be an opportunity to recruit good talent. There's gonna be an opportunity to build a culture, to build something that lasts. And to me, 
coaching begins with culture, just like teaching begins with culture. Bringing up kids in a silent home is about culture. It's not just the rules and the principles. It's about a culture. It's about knowing what's expected inside of the culture. And so I'm saying all of that to say that I, I'm really excited. It can it can go it can go bad real quick. But right now, I think that it's a good thing. I think that there are, there are some concerns. One of the thing is with me is I'm doing everything I can to steer my young one away from football and to something a less, a lot less violent, uh, like basketball or baseball. Uh, and luckily, he's 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 he played football this year, but I think that's his last year. Um, and he, uh, he's a freshman. This is last year, so he's gonna probably do uh, only basketball here on out. You know, whatever. Maybe do some track or something, but that'll be hard with basketball season and track season pretty much around the same time. But that's but 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 that's like one of my concerns is just football period right now. Uh, the there was a preliminary or uh, not preliminary report, a final report that uh, it appears that. Vincent Jackson, uh, who used to play for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, who was found uh, dead in a hotel room, I think earlier this year, maybe last year sometime, come to find out that he was in stage two of uh, CTE, which is the brain uh, deterioration uh, that comes from blow after blow of playing football. Um, and that's happened a lot. And I think that it's gonna be a lot more prevalent moving forward i think that they've come up with some some uh policies uh, on how the game can be played to make it a little safer but it's a it's a it's, it's a game where people are moving at top speed and the goal is to stop or to run over somebody and you're going to hit the ground sometimes your head's going to hit the ground no you can't have helmet to helmet contact anymore but it's going to happen it's inevitable but even with that, you st your head still hits the ground. Your head can still get kneed by someone. Anytime you get a concussion, there's some bruising to the brain. And over time, that's gonna have a negative impact on the health of the brain. One of the things we're learning in psychology is a lot of the things we were contributing to other factors have been lesions on the brain and other things on the brain that were people weren't aware of because they weren't doing scans. They were getting th therapeutic uh, intervention treatments for things that they couldn't control, impulse control issues and things of that nature, come to find out that there's damage to the prefrontal co uh, cortex from uh, head injuries, from falling down on a flight of stairs when they were a certain age and all this. Just imagine that type of behavior is coming from one person. I mean, from one event. And then you got somebody who plays a sport for five, 10, 15 years, multiple collisions. You got to know that there are some dangers that that's that's a part of it that I'm concerned about. But that's more on a an entirely whole level of, of, of a sport that I absolutely loved uh, and benefited from. But it's, it's dangerous. And with that being said, the, the, the gist of what I'm getting across is what if we adapted the principal concept and idea and we scaled it out and we start investing in stuff that was ours instead of trying to fit into theirs instead of trying to make them accept us instead of trying to uh get them to see how special we are how great we are please pick me what if we started to just build our own and i'm gonna tell you something when i uh was in the clothing industry one of the things that i specialized in outside of just regular urban wear and shoes and you know sneakers uh and stuff like that in, in my stores is the i sold a lot of negro league uh um uh, apparel and paraphernalia and it made me learn so much about the Negro League and just how powerful it is. And it made me start to understand that what happened with Jackie Robinson entering into the majors wasn't simply because the majors wanted his talent. It was because the question was arising of just how talented the Negro League was and that the Negro League actually had more talent than the major league. And that's a discussion still up for debate. 
So what I'm saying is that was powerful. So what they did is they started inviting us in to theirs. And because everybody, because it's the majors, it's the major leagues, everybody's like, hey, I want to go in the mail. And eventually what did they do? It ended the Negro League. It ended something we owned and we controlled where we stood and we, we prevailed and it was ours. And we did, they, did, we did, they did that with the busing companies, with the movie theaters. They did that with everything. We just were so, just so intent on integrating into their world that we gave up ours. And so when I see Dion doing what he's doing, I see us taking back something that's ours and having pride in it and wanting to build it and wanting it to be its best and, and, and investing in it in ways that other people will definitely not invest in it. And, and, and Dion is, you can say, is a big, big and bright. He is a, a, a high achiever and he could have probably got a coaching job at uh, definitely a D1 school uh, with his pedigree, uh, but he chose Jackson State. And to me, that, that was huge. It, it set the standard. Now you can start saying to players, you can be great at a SBU. You can be good enough to get drafted coming out of HBCU. What am I getting at? Look, we've got to be our best and our, our strongest advocates. We've got to build within our own culture and our own institutions. We'll never become empowered by operating through their institutions, never. That's something that we have to understand. So on that note, I'm gonna get out of here. I need to get in this gym, uh, make some things happen. Uh, again, got to go into this new year uh, on, a, on a powerful note so far so good but a long way to go anyway with that being said I'm out of here don't forget we are right now closing out the year we definitely are in need of your support if you believe in the work that we do at the Odyssey Project please go to the description box click the link or give directly through our cash app account and support the work we do it's appreciated. On that note, I'm out of here.